Visit ATWSource.com to take the next step along your path of awakening. You're listening to Awakening Truth Worldwide Radio and its network of radio shows. Presented by the teachers of Awakening Truth Worldwide, where spirituality, truth, and consciousness collide. Welcome to A Guiding Light. I'm Dr. Joseph Mara, and I'll be your host for the next 90 minutes. I'll be joined by my special guests and good friends, Mike Dickinson and Amy Schlutterbach. Mike and Amy have traveled the world researching and making documentaries of sustainable life outside the current system. Can life be sustainable off the grid? How can this be done and how can people survive? Tune in as we discuss the possibilities. Mike and Amy, welcome to A Guiding Life. Hey, Joe. How are you? Hi, Joe. Excellent. I'm very good. (laughs) Beautiful day out here in Oregon. Oh, yeah? What's the temperature? Uh, I think it's close to 80 today. Is that right? Yeah. We were uh, traveling in New Mexico. Uh, We were in Las Vegas earlier today. Uh, Myself, uh, my friend uh, Joe, his wife, which a good friend of mine also, Sandy, a prior employee of mine, and my good friend Terry, and she happens to be here beside me, which you guys know. Uh, I think she spent some time with you recently, right? Yeah. Hi, Terry. It's great to hear from you again. Oh, it's great to hear from you guys also. It was a wonderful seven days I spent up there with you guys. I even feel, I still feel healthy just from being in that fresh air and um, and living that communal type living. Nice. It's amazing what a clean environment will do for your health, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, let's start off with telling the listeners who you are and how you got to where you are today. Okay. Well, the story starts in, at about 2010. Amy and I went to Ethiopia for about nine weeks, and we were filming a documentary about the evolution of cooperation. And we were specifically looking at um, NGOs and nonprofits and just looking at how we work together and how we help one another and what that process is look, looks like. Um, specifically, we were looking at development and issues like sustainability, and we visited a variety of grassroots organizations. After a while, we kind of came up with the conclusion, it occurred to us that a lot of this idea of sustainability and development really starts with the individual. If we want to create a sustainable lifestyle here for the global community, we have to do that as individuals. So that was pretty powerful for both of us. So after that journey, we returned back to Seattle where we were living, and we just realized that uh, we were out of alignment with the way that we wanted to be living. So we left Seattle on 10 10 10 as it kind of like exploded in a ball of flames behind us. And that began our journey looking at other communities Uh, throughout the Pacific Northwest. We visited places on Glemis Island and the San Juan Islands. We visited a Permaculture Institute, Opera Vecho, um, Iseti Ranch in Washington. And we were filming a documentary around this concept about uh, sustainability and what what it takes to live that way. And this led us to where we are now at a place called Birch Creek Arts and Ecology Center in Trillium Farm. And we were filming, and they asked us to stay, basically, uh, because we all really kind of were like-minded. We had the same values. And the land itself is just, I mean, Terry can vouch for us. It's, it's incredible. Um, basically, we live with on 80 acres of pristine wilderness. We have a back 500. Uh, we have our own watershed. We're the only humans who drink from the water that comes down. Uh, there's roughly anywhere between five and eight community community members, and it's a pretty spectacular place. Um, the Little Applegate is the area that we live in. It's full of a lot of conscious people, people who are really into organic farming, uh, similar ideas about sustainable development, 
and you know they have CSAs and um, community schools and all sorts of really really powerful programs that was very eye opening for both Amy and I. Um, another thing that's really interesting about the place where we live at is it's a vortex, like it's an actual vortex. The mountains and the river create a natural uh, vortex energy system, and it has a lot of power that it brings through the individual. So that has a tendency to bring up a lot of your issues. And living in community, that's what it's all about, is getting through those issues that you've ideally been working on for your whole life. Yeah, uh -huh. I think that's a really fascinating point that Mike was making um, about the vortex and, and things coming up because we're drawn to these areas that are sacred so that we can begin working through our block, our blocks to our ultimate um, potential, essentially. And so this place where we're living is absolutely no exception uh, to the rule. It's, it is a sacred land. It is a place where Native Americans have been coming for a very long time um, to heal and to supercharge themselves. Uh, the water, as Mike said, it comes from a pristine watershed. It's, it's very sacred water. Uh, you walk the watershed and you can feel the energies of all the nature spirits that live there and do the water with this very, very powerful energy that ends up living out in the people who have chosen to make this place their home. Okay, um, Amy and Mike, um, I'm going to ask you, just for the uh, people that are listening in, um, under, or help, help everyone to understand what a vortex is. Well, in this case, we're actually talking about a geologic vortex. Um, this is a place where ley lines come together and create a pattern of energy that is very, very tightly knit. So um, if, you're, if you look at a map, um, so you're going to go for a hike or something, and you look at the mountains, and as you look at a really steep mountain, all of the little lines are really close together on the map. That is a vortex of energy there because the closer and the tighter knit everything becomes, the more the energy starts to almost run into one another. And we live at the base of this watershed. Like we are at, literally at the bottom of the canyon. So just imagine all of this energy that pools up in this region and just funneling down through the canyon and impacting all of the creatures that live within that are affected by the energy that moves through this system. Right. So would you um, expect for, say, somebody who's not uh, uh, familiar with uh, these types of experiences, if they do go into uh, a geological vortex, as you say, do you feel that not only do they feel maybe a positive in the moment, and maybe kind of swaying back and forth with their physicalness, but it may also bring up some negativity or blockages or what some people may perceive as negative, but they're bringing up stuff that you have been hanging on to to kind of release. Would you say that's true? Huh. Oh, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, that's actually a big part of um, what we've experienced as residents and stewards of this this very, very sacred space is um, you're living not only in a, a geologic vortex, but you're also living in community, which is another vortex, the social vortex, um, that creates an atmosphere where you've constantly got your stuff coming up. Um, and it can change in an instant. That's what's so amazing about vortexes is that the energies are so tight that um, seriously peace is just a breath away. Um, so you may be in the moment not understanding why you're feeling these emotions, but it's really the individual who chooses to hold on to that emotion and make it into something bigger because change is just a breath away, and all you have to do is say, okay, I'm not going to feel this way and release it. And that's really, truly the healing power of the land is right. right there because it gives you an opportunity to face your stuff. Right. And so basically what I'm getting at is if you do go as a couple, you're going to have to put up with each other's stuff that you've either carried with you this lifetime or even cellular memories from other lifetimes and maybe have compassion for one another and maybe even expect the unexpected because there's going to be some stuff that comes up that's projected outward that's maybe not for the other person, but it's just a way of releasing that particular 
lower vibratory energy or frequency. And therefore, after it's you surrender and release and allow yourself to raise in vibration, uh, you know, then it's almost like you can get on with it and you can get over it. And the, your partner or the person you're with, as long as they're open and understanding of this, then you kind of kind of help each other through the process. Do you see any of that going on? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Amy and I pretty much spend, I would, what would you say, 23 and a half hours a day together. <laughs> so we're constantly interacting. We're constantly having different ideas of the way to turn compost or grill the onions or whatever it may be. And, I mean, you just have to remember that we are all divine mirrors for one another. And if I'm having an issue with someone else because I don't like the way that they're doing something, whose problem is that really if I'm the one that's getting triggered? So if we can be living in compassion and understand that we're all here helping each other grow and evolve and really truly learn to work and to live together, then the process is much easier than if we were to struggle and paddle against the current and blaming and projecting all of our fears on other people. Right. So, so going to flow? I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to add, it's, it's just like layers of an onion sometimes, though. It's like you'll have a little tip and you'll think, okay, I was able to stay grounded in that one and everything went okay. And then, you know, 15 minutes later, it's all back up and you come to realize that there's, there's deeper and deeper levels of healing that need to take place in order for true transformation and evolution to take, be able to move in and do its work. So um, it, it's quite a journey living and working together on the land um, in a vortex. Yes, yeah, it's a continued process. It's not like you just, okay, I got rid of my cellular memories or my, my issues, so now I can live happily ever after. It's a constant, as you say, like an onion. There's lots of layers. And about the time you think you've shed it all, something comes to your awareness and you're like, what? I thought I already did or dealt with all this. Exactly, exactly. And I think that that's ultimately the major, major challenge we have to sustainability right now is that it's, it's not about these external technologies not being there, you know, like the free energy or the food or whatever, because all of that exists. It's really the inner landscape of the individuals who are trying to create systems where we can live, work, and be abundant, healthy human beings together. And it, it, the hardest part of all of that is working through your stuff. Right. Yeah, so... Where we're, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you um, in reference to how can you put this whole communal setting, like um, you have it in a, in a mountain um, area where they're around, surrounded by nature, but how could you change this whole setting, this communal setting, to function, per se, in a small town? Do you mean taking what we're doing in nature and taking that same community setting and putting it in a small town? Yeah, creating a small communal town that can function just like you're, you've been talking about in the in the Trillion Ranch. Right, and. I, that's the big challenge right now is that we're we're wanting to see community happen on this big scale. And there are particular communities that have done this successfully. Um, Dominher is doing that. There's also a lot of transition towns that are popping up, especially on the West Coast, where people are really trying to take these ideas of sustainability and implement them in their cities. Um, so they're looking at design systems that provide sustainable energy, that pro provide sustainable food, that has a sustainable social systems, including monetary systems and economic systems. And so we are taking it to another level. I think it ultimately it depends on the individuals who are comprising the collective. So here at Trillium Farm, we're really intimate. There's only five, maybe ten of us, um, it fluctuates at times, living on the land at once. And so it's an incredibly intimate experience where stuff is coming up and we're all constantly on top of each other and there's energies flying around and everything, but you take this same model and you start to see people who are doing this with 100, 200 people and making it work. Um, 
ultimately it depends on the inner landscape of the individuals. And is it your purpose? Are you supposed to be a part of a larger community or a smaller community? And ultimately those are the questions you have to ask yourself prior to jumping into community. Yeah, you know, it's what my next question was, um, what would uh, be an unexpected responsibility uh, for someone who has lived in, say, a big city all their life? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Making your food from scratch every single day, three times a day. No microwaves, no blenders. I mean, where we live, we have no electricity. So it's, you know, we live at the bottom of a hill, so every time we want to get some fresh vegetables, we have to climb down the hill. We have to pick our food. We have to climb back up the hill. We've got to cut them. We've got to chop them. We've got to prepare it. Then we have to eat it. And then we have to do it two more times in the day. You know, that's practically three hours of your time spent focusing that way. Well, I think you just said it right there. One of the biggest things coming from a city is what happens to time when you're back in nature. Uh, In the city, you know, everything is snap, 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 one thing after the other. If you want something to eat, it's right there. It's convenient. It's just a step away. Whereas living out in nature, you're really living under a whole different set of rules. And time does this strange thing where it really just starts to bend and um, you get really caught up in the moment and it ends up taking a whole lot longer to do really simple tasks. Um, Another big unexpected uh, change from the city is just your connection to the systems that sustain your life. Yes. Yes. Your energy system. So, for example, our energy system is wood. We chop the wood, we find the, the trees in the forest, we chop it, we collect it, we haul it. haul it, we split it, and then ultimately that is what heats us in the winter time. So we're really connected to that entire process. Same thing with our food. We take the seedlings, we put them in the ground, and that's a whole system, it's a whole cycle that you have to tune into and be a part of. And that's really just kind of whole system thinking and permaculture, essentially. Um, but it's It's quite an adjustment if you're used to closed-ended systems like back in the city where all you have to do is take a dollar bill and say, hey, I'd like a sandwich. Yeah, you know, it sounds like there's a lot of preparedness that is involved in this that, you know, if you don't plan at least for the future for, um, I'm thinking of all the things you just said. I mean, you have to have wood that's uh, stored up uh, for the winter time that will get you through the winter as well as food, because in the winter months, uh, the growing season may not be such in an area that's not sunny year-round, like, say, California or Florida. Uh, there are a lot of places across the United States that just don't have that that type of uh, uh, environment that you can grow year-round. So you almost have to be prepared in such a way, depending on the region that you uh, intend to live, to be prepared to uh, weather out the, the winter or the, the months where you you couldn't uh, grow your own food or it, where it's like four feet of snow where you can't, you simply just can't get out and chop the wood. So if you have it there um, kind of put back for a rainy day, so to speak, then you're much more prepared. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the term that I would almost use instead would be equipped to do so because ultimately it does come back to the community component. And, you know, there's nothing that we we ultimately can't do if we're working cooperatively together. Um, we could create a greenhouse and you could have food year-round. You could um, chop all the, the wood you need for your entire community if that was the goals of the community itself. But um, if you're just living by yourself out on the land, there's definitely a lot of challenges to that. Uh, we live in an intentional community. So one of the intentions of our community is to create a certain level of sustainability for ourselves. But there's also a lot of people we know here in the area who uh, claim to live in unintentional communities. And essentially they live way, way out in the woods and they've got their own land, their own little house, but yet they have five or six neighbors that live right there next to them. Because when it comes down to it in those winter months, if you need some help, you need someone to be able to help you. You need to be able to go over and say, hey, man, I need I need some wood. I, I need some food. I can't get out of the mountains right now and have that relationship established. So um, we've got these things that we can do 
in the external world, like, um, you know, have plenty of food for the winter, stock up and have our big big basement full. But ultimately, there's always going to be something that's going to come up that we need to be equipped to handle. Together. Yes. Right. So um, what types of tools, I mean, I'm thinking, I mean, if you're uh, going to tackle such a task, I'm assuming you would have to have uh, an axe to chop the wood. You may need something to cultivate the land, um, a bucket or something to haul the water for um, watering, unless you have uh, some type of irrigation system. Uh, what do you have in uh, in your particular community? Uh, your standard farm equipment, really. You know, I mean, yeah, you've got the axe, you've got the barn to hold the wood, you've got the shovel to dig the ditch. Um, it's pretty much just figuring out which tools work best for you and what job you are best suited for. Um, there, there's so much involved in the day-to-day -day tasks that you soon realize that you do need more tools because another problem or another challenge has arisen and you've got to take care of it because a water line just burst. And so you go, oh my gosh, I don't have any equipment to deal with this burst water valve. I guess I have to go to town. How do I do that? And that goes back to Amy saying, you know, you need to be able to communicate with those in the surrounding neighborhood, your community or whatever, and see who has that expertise and how we can all kind of learn from each other to best equip ourselves for whatever challenges may arise. Yeah, to best complement one another as well so we don't have a design system where particular functions are being repeated. So, for example, we live in a community where right down the road um, there's a full greenhouse and they do all of the seedlings and they all the starts are prepared right down the road. So it doesn't really make sense for us to also have a full-blown greenhouse producing seedlings and start because that would be a, a repeat of a function that's already being t taken place in the community. So, you know, as far as tools go, it it's really gets catered to the community at which you're a part of and um, what it is that you need. And I think that ultimately that comes down to what is it that your community, if it's an intentional community, what are you guys trying to accomplish together? and asking yourself those questions and seeing if you've got the physical tools in the world to make that happen. Yeah, and it, it's, it's tricky because so so much of this is, is really challenging because you don't know until you're actually working with the people yeah. and you're, because it, it happens organically, you know. If you're creating a whole new design system by being together and working together cooperatively to make something bigger than yourself happen for the world at large. Okay, so how would you get the ne the, the necessity? You know, like the food, the water, the shelter, the heat, and because um, many people think that like solar, um, uh, wind, you know, like windmills or a combination of the two is the the way to go. What do you think about that? I think that there's a whole host of different types of technology out there, and that completely depends on the environment that you're that you're living on. So if you're living on a, a sunny hillside without any water, it wouldn't make much sense to use hydro hydroelectric power. Um, I guess the the first thing that I would consider is what does my land offer, and what can I use to to take advantage of that in in a sustainable way and at the same time benefit the land itself. Yeah, we, right. we operate in a world where there's a lot of limiting paradigms. We, we want to immediately, what a lot of people think about when they think about sustainability and getting back to the land is they think about their energy system. How am I going to get power? And for me personally, I almost feel like that's kind of like the creme de la creme. You know, free energy and power, it's, it's a thing that all of us talk about and say, oh, yeah, it's there, we know it's out there, and it's kind of elusive, and it seems like we should have the technology, and maybe someone's keeping it from us, and it 
it, it's this whole limiting paradigm because we're thinking that it's something that we can't accomplish ourselves as a community. So I, what I personally believe is that those energy systems, the ability to have those that energy coming to you is a byproduct of the inner landscape of the community members and what you're doing together. So what I say is I, I say start with the people. Start with one another. Start with what do you have available to you and what is it that you're trying to accomplish? And what are the limiting paradigms to that? And then start working through those things together. And I think the energy systems and everything else will come because the technology is out there. The design systems are out there. I mean, look at nature. They're not having any problem with finding energy. It's us. It's human beings that are having problems finding energy because we're creating this limited paradigm that it needs to be delivered to me in a certain way. I need to have it on tap all the time, and I don't have to do anything for it. And I think that that's, that's why it seems like this far off thing. It seems like this challenging ordeal all the time. Yeah, you know, it seems to me that um, each uh, specific community would have to um, be able to come together and brainstorm and um, rely on one another and also be open to other people's ideas within that particular community to uh, be beneficial to one another or the collective. Oh, absolutely. And I think that the same goes with money. We, we're we really challenged by energy and money. And I think that all of those things really, when those things are flowing easily into your system, then it is a representation of the work that you all have done together to create that ease of exchange. Because when each element in a solution is fulfilling its purpose, it starts to become infectious. And then all of the elements within a particular community or a, com a system are starting to also fulfill their purpose. And then it ripples out into the world. So those things that we feel limited by, like not enough money or not enough energy or not enough food, begin to flow in with ease because we are exchanging with the outside world in a way that is, that is cooperative. Right. Okay. So... Um is there is everyone equal in this type of community setting or is there a hierarchy are, are the, what did you say sorry oh i'm sorry is everyone equal um in this type of community setting or is there does there have to be some type of a hierarchy involved I don't think that there ever has to necessarily be a hierarchy per se but they do arise and the trick is knowing the role and the and the what you have to offer and where your talents are best suited. And as that fully emerges, then that kind of uh, paradigm of a hierarchy begins to become more circular. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, hierarchies do work for some people. There's definitely people um, in the... I, I don't know, the matrix or the paradigm that hierarchies work really well. They, they enjoy getting their orders and their the things they need to do from somebody else. Um, but there's lots of other systems that seem to be working really well, social systems that are starting to develop. And like Mike said, they're more circular. Um, I think that it's, we try to make things into a hierarchy just because somebody is is the final decision maker doesn't necessarily mean that it's organized like a hierarchy. It just means that that's somebody's role. Exactly. And so as you develop whatever system works best for your community, you need to understand what it is that you have to offer and feel comfortable in that, feel confident in that, and feel empowered by it. Um, and then I don't think it really matters if you're the decision maker or not because you're, you're offering what it is that you came to earth to offer. And that is extremely fulfilling in itself. And so there's not this whole system of of, of need and um, I don't know, doubt, lack. lack and doubt and you know not feeling worthy and all of these lower level emotions that come up. Um, I think they're really limited by the mind and this way that we have we have organized ourselves as 
um, not being worthy if we don't have lots of money or power. So, so everybody has. So, so everybody who would um, be a part of this type of community um, uh, social living would find their their um, comfortable spot. Uh, along with what everybody else is, but say somebody comes in who has the ability to work as a nurse or medicine or somebody else who's good at gardening or someone else who may be a good counselor, you know, in reference to maybe helping others to see, help them get out of their, their, um, their, um, uh, the baggage that they might be carrying or bringing into the center. So yeah, that makes- absolutely. I think I think that really comes uh, back to purpose and finding out what it is we truly have to offer our world at large. And you know, in today's system, we need to be more encouraged to really discover our passions, discover who we are, what makes me really excited about living. And then, if we're able to take that into our external world, then it truly amazing things happen. Uh, if we're allowed to just kind of have that free reign of creativity and self-expression, then then we are all fulfilling our individual roles, like Amy said, that we came here to fulfill. And and then we do move away from this idea of a hierarchy or taking orders for, from someone, and we can begin to just fall into more of our, our natural inherent gifts and, and position of, of living on this planet. Okay. Um, You guys ready for some callers? Yeah, absolutely. All right. We're going to open up the phone lines. We have somebody waiting in the wings right now. So, okay. Hello, caller. Welcome to A Guiding Light. Do you have a question? Um, uh, Yeah. um, This is uh, Enoch, and uh, I lived at Trillium with Amy and Mike, and now I live down the road. And, um... I'm just wondering uh, how how to make the connection to the larger society um, as far as mainstream culture. Who don't who, uh, like how do we make that connection when they're not aware of what's going on of like in in our lives that are off the grid? Yeah, that's it. That is a great question. Uh, for example, Amy and I are filmmakers, you know, and we rely on having accessible internet. We rely on having electricity. We rely on people. And we live, you know, about an hour from town. We live in a cabin without internet or electricity. And so, yeah, it's really challenging to meet the demands of, okay, I came to Earth with a purpose. Here's my creative outlet. But here I am living with this community of like-minded individuals. They all think like me. Yet there's another reality out there. And how do I fulfill uh, or, or express what it is that I need to do? Um, I guess it you know, comes back to like that, that idea of permaculture and looking at your surroundings and looking at, okay, what does the system need? What is my own role within that system? And how can I best, best fit into that role so that I'm you know, fulfilling my purpose and benefiting uh, mankind on a whole? And... A lot of times in life, you know, there's certain sacrifices. So I'm sacrificing having electricity to get, uh, you know, the editing that we need to get done for our film. So we have to drive to town and use the library internet and plug in to the grid to sit in a cramped cubby and edit. Um, that is, is a sacrifice. Well, I think essentially... Um a big part of it is looking at the system that you're a part of, the design system that you're a part of, and trying to figure out what is the purpose of that design system as a whole. Um, And, Enoch, I I think you guys are affecting the world at large because of just the way that you're living. I mean, you guys are creating sustainable food, food that is organic, that is good, that is helps people heal their bodies and um, the CSAs that you're involved in and um, the goat share program that you just created is helping the world at large because as more and more people begin to 
catch wind of what you're doing, it's infection, and it'll grow to a size where the outside world can't deny that this is happening anymore. And, mm-hmm. you know, right now it may not look like the outside world really has any idea of what we're doing out here off the grid, but as these smaller communities get linked up with one another, like in the CSA program, and then they get bigger and bigger, it's going to be hard to deny what we're doing. Um, so, yeah, I'd say what you keep doing what you're doing and you are affecting the world. <laughs> Awesome, thanks, Joe. All right, thank you, caller. Okay, so um, if there are any other callers, uh, the call in number is 323 679 0927. You have any questions for Mike or Amy, uh, please call in. All right, so uh, let's see. Um, so in other words, do you feel like you have to have like-minded people in a community, obviously, in order to make this work? I mean, if you have people that are butting heads all the time, obviously you're not going to get anything done. And you have to be at least open-minded in order to uh, accomplish some of the goals that you set out to uh, accomplish, right? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, as we've mentioned, we live in an intentional community. So, for example, the intention of the community that we live in, it's a, it's a vegetarian community. and no meat is allowed on the land. Another part is there's no pets because it's an environmental, it's a wilderness preserve that we live on. So I think one of the major things that we need to think about when we're considering living in community is where do I draw the line? How open-minded can we be? And where are saying, okay, we cannot allow people to eat meat here, period, because it goes against our values. Um, you know, if you're if you're not okay with that, then you probably shouldn't be living in that community. But if there are people that come in with new ideas that the other, you know, general uh, group of the community really identify with, but they've had this other concept of this is the way it needs to be, is the general community able to adapt and to work together and come to a, a conclusion where everyone benefits? How rigid are our beliefs? Uh, determines how rich our, our lifestyle and our happiness is. Right. And, it's and not, it comes back to you're, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And so if there's something within the community or someone within the community who is so locked against the overall goal of the community, then it is it's the duty of the community itself to actually tune in to what that is about and help remove it and help move the energy. Um, because that's ultimately what it is. It's a major, major energy game amongst all of the community members to make something bigger than themselves happen. And um, being like-minded is really important. Having an idea of what it is that you guys are all excited about and remembering it. I think that's the most important part is remember what brought you together in the first place and never lose sight of that because what happens is People get together in a community, they're excited about everything, and then there's like this honeymoon period and everything kind of starts to fizzle after that. And ultimately, we get further and further away from why it is that we initially all came together. Um, So that's what, I think that's a big part of why communities fail. You know, um, 90% of communities don't work because I believe they lose sight of what it is that they were coming together to do in the first place. Um, Everything else is just working through your blocks and doing that healing work to make it happen. So it sounds like that people need to have flexibility. Absolutely. Flexibility is an incredibly important part of it. And I think that flexibility is a function of compassion. And that's ultimately the biggest lesson that I've learned. Yeah, for sure. I mean, as we work together, as we've mentioned again and again, uh, all of our stuff comes to the surface. And we, I think humans in general maybe have a tendency to project their own fear, their own insecurities onto other people. And if the community is aware that that's what's happening and we are able to stay grounded and stay compassionate as we all go through this process, no one is exempt. We are all going through this healing together. Uh, life is going to be so much easier than if we just 
sit around and blame each other for uh, not fulfilling our roles that, we, that need to get done, the, the daily tasks. Yeah, I've I've been talking a lot to Mike lately about, you know, living in community for me has been putting all this work that I've been doing for so long, all my inner work, all of my meditations, all of the classes, all of the healing, all all of that stuff to the test. Because you can sit all day up at your place and meditate by yourself, but when it really becomes, you know, in play is when you're in community and you're talking with somebody and they're triggering the heck out of you and you've got all kinds of stuff coming up and it's them, it's them, it's them, it's them. And you have to find that place of peace and compassion because ultimately that is that divine mirror and you're looking right back at yourself. And... That's the work that needs to be done. So it, it's really a fascinating process, and it's nothing that I think you can really prepare for by just having all your MREs ready and some firewood stocked up for the winter because it's yeah. like this is real stuff. This is, this is why we came here, to work together and make something happen. Yeah, you know, it it sounds like you also, each individual person has to have their own discernment and also as a collective because you mentioned um, two key uh, variables here, one of which is, uh, you know, not to point fingers and to blame another person for your own issues. However, if there is one person or a couple people maybe even in the community that is not at your level of awareness, you're vibrating at your level or has the same... Uh, end result goal or doesn't want to work on themselves, I mean, there's several things, um, then are you not responsible for walking away from something that's not truly working for you as an individual or a collective or having that person move away? You already mentioned that part. part. So it sounds to me like there's got to be some kind of discernment there also that uh, to, to balance this whole uh, community uh, aspect. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when something happens within the community and one person is not fulfilling their duty, say the plants aren't getting watered and this person's supposed to water and all their food dies, well, it's the responsibility of you as an individual and the whole community to gather around and compassionately say, hey, you know, this is an issue that's come up and, and if we continue along this route, we're not going to have any food. So either you can perform this duty that we all need, that you've chosen, that you've accepted as your role, or maybe you're not fit for this community. And what I look at living in community is it's just like it is the microcosm of the macrocosm. Our problems in an, a small environment are reflected in our, in our external matrix world. We look around and we're, you know, our stores are full of GMO foods, so what is the best way to deal with that as a collective? Do we go screaming and uh, shouting outside of Monsanto and saying, hey, this can't, this can't go on, I'm so angry, or do we, you know, come together as a community and say, hey, you know, we need to keep Monsanto out of, of our lives by, by not supporting with our, with our energy, with our dollars. Yeah, if something is happening in an ecosystem that's not healthy for it, you see all of the other living things in that ecosystem move in and take action on it immediately. Like if you see bacteria growing where bacteria shouldn't be, as long as there's enough of the good bacteria growing there, it'll move in and totally clean it up. So it's the same for community. Um, it, sometimes it, it cleans it up by completely removing it from the system. You know, it, it doesn't necessarily change it or try to make it into something that it's not. It just takes it out. And I think that that's essentially what we're trying to do on a large scale these days. And and just to kind of go off of what Mike was saying, this being in a microcosm with a macrocosm, this also works for really positive things that are happening. Um, I have this example. One night we had a really heartfelt community discussion um, amongst the, the community members, and uh, Mike and I were really trying to express where we're at personally in our lives and where we're headed and um, it, was, it was really difficult to bring all of this up and put it out on the table and say, this is where I'm being fulfilled, this is where I'm not being fulfilled. And the people in our community were so incredibly compassionate, understanding, their hearts were open, 
and they were able to receive this in a way that I seriously even just talking about it start to vibrate because I believe that that moment when we all had that compassionate intera- interaction, that it reverberated out and affected this entire planet. Just the five of us sitting around and having a compassionate conversation. And I, that's the way this stuff works. It's a vibration. It's so high when you are working with a collective of people and it is happening in a co-creative manner, you are reverberating out into this entire world and it is changing the overall solution. Yeah, you know what? I agree with you totally. I mean, that, that really rings true to me. Um, as an energy healer, practitioner, however you want to uh, term it, um, yeah, the microcosm it does, definitely affects the macro and vice versa. And because everything everything that we can and cannot perceive is energy, uh, I truly believe uh, exactly what you're saying. So um, a couple things I want to do here. One, I'm going to uh, ask the callers, uh, again, if uh, you want to call in, we have, uh, oh, let's see, about 15 minutes left. We're going to have uh, Mike and Amy on the line. So the call-in number is 323-679-0927. If you have any questions, uh, you have about 15 minutes to call in um, to ask these guys uh, uh, whatever you have to ask them. And uh, the next thing, um, how can uh, the listeners get a hold of you or find out more information about what you're doing? Uh, what Do you have websites? And, and uh, uh, you mentioned the documentaries that you did. Yeah, yeah. Our website is www.themapmakers.org. Um, that's T-H-E-M-A-P-M-A-K-E-R-S. And there you'll find um, all the documentaries we've done. We've really set our focus here recently on education. Um, we believe that all of the work that we're doing is, is essentially research. It's, um, as map makers, we're going out and we're exploring the unknown, and our maps are coming out in the form of documentary films, writing, um, pictures, all kinds of made of media to help educate people about different opportunities in this world and a, a different viewpoint on what's happening. Um, it, it's not all doom and gloom these days. There's a lot of really positive, inspiring work taking place on this planet, and we're doing our best to map that out. Yeah, that's great, Amy. I think that's the reason, that is the reason why we started the film company is because we just got so tired of looking at all of this negative media out there. The mainstream is doom and gloom. And the only way to change is to do something about it, you know? So we really set our intentions to, okay, just because we're going to give some nice, uh, good, heartfelt media doesn't mean it has to be boring. We can make some really exciting, really educational, and, and raise the vibration, raise the consciousness by really giving people hope, give, giving people ideas on where they can change their perceptions because that's what it's all about. It's about shifting your perception into a reality that works best for you and for the collective. And if you can do that, wow, the, the universe opens. The synchronicities happen. The coincidences just one after the other start taking place, and you find yourself living in your purpose because you've changed your perception. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you think about the concept of a map and what a map is, it gives you an idea of the landscape, the physical landscape of the world, and it opens up opportunities and potential for the person who is looking at it. So we consider ourselves, we call ourselves the map makers, but we consider ourselves just map makers. We're just part of a whole collective of people who are moving out into the world and using their art and their talents to create a new perception of the, the landscape in which we live so that people can go and travel to all those places and into those different perceptions and points of view and uh, discover who they are in the process. So um, that's really the work we do um, as the map makers. But uh, just kind of to expand on that, I also want to let people know that we're also accepting interns out on the land where we're living right now. And we've got an internship program that's getting ready to start. Um, you can earn university credit um, as a part of this internship program, which is really great. It's a 
a, a way to, you know, be involved in the system while simultaneously doing the work that needs to be done and being one of those very, very important bridge builders between the outside world and what's going on off the grid right now. Um, and you can find out more information about that by visiting our website. And we also are hosting a really fabulous event um, this August and it's called the Bioregionalist Activist Gathering. And it's going to be about 120 people out on the land where we're living right now, and we're going to create a temporary village. Um, it's basically like community on the spot. Uh, we're all going to come together, and we're going to study the landscape, both the personal landscape of the people who have gathered, as well as the physical landscape in which we're living, and create a village that is appropriate for that. So um, it's a really fantastic gathering, and uh, I hope that lots of people come and join us for that uh, experiment. Yeah, you know what? You you partially answered um, the very next question that we have for you, but I'm going to let Terry ask this question that she has for you, and maybe you can uh, reiterate what you just said, but maybe in other directions you may have other uh, insight on this. But go ahead, Terry. Okay. Um, there are probably some of the listeners out there that feel that this is um, too difficult to start on their own. What would you say to the, those people? I would say begin with your day-to-day -day activities. If you're wanting to live in community and you live in an apartment complex, go knock on doors. Meet your neighbors. Uh, all of this happens with extending your hand and welcoming strangers into your life because that's what it's all about. It's about meeting people and discussing life. You know, we can get past the chit chat. We can get right to the meat of it and, and really form a heart relationship with, with everyone. There's there's really no limit to it. So if you think this is difficult, begin uh take the small steps, you know, what is it that uh you want in community and how can you start to implement that in your day to day life? And I think the key to all of that is being present. You know, just find your center and look around and say, okay, what am I being called to do here? Am I being called to serve the land? Am I being called to serve everyone else? Am I being called to listen? Am I being called to just sit here in the park and watch the birds? Uh, if you really go within and you find that space of just being present, it all unfolds on its own. And setting the intention that, yeah, I want to be in community, I'm going to make this happen, and you, you don't doubt, you have the faith, uh, it'll happen. And I, I actually would say, Terry, um, to part of that is that it is too difficult for some people. For some people, it's not appropriate living in community in the way that we are. And I think that it starts with knowing that about yourself, knowing about what, what are you willing to give to the system at large. Because I think a lot of people are going to stay in this paradigm where it's way too difficult and it'll never happen that way and I can't do it and, you know, allow them to be in their perfection in that and kind of move on. Because um, we get, all we can do is, is work on ourselves. And for me, there was a lot of difficulties to this whole entire thing, but yet there was no turning back once I got awakened to the idea that we could live differently, that I could... I could wake up every day and jump out of bed and say, I am so happy to be alive, so happy. And I'm ready to go and plant that garden and, you know, create the documentary films and share this with other people. Because through that work, I feel fulfilled. But, you know, there's difficult things in that path. Um, you know, that's all just a part of the healing process, I think. Awesome. We have uh, another caller. We have enough time for like one more uh, uh, call in here. So let me get this person on the line. Hello, caller. Uh, area code 775. Welcome to A Guiding Light. Hey, yeah, this is Al from uh, Reno, Nevada. Yeah. Hey, yeah, I was just calling to, call to see uh, as far as sustainable living, do you think a lot of people will, will be forced into change or do you think they'll do it willingly? As uh, you know, we have technological breakdowns or or, or intermittent uh, supply breakdowns and things like that. Do you, do you think it'll be a, a shock in, into into changing, or will most people go along willingly? Hey, Al, great question. I think 
ultimately, yeah, we will be forced into change. Um, at, at the current rate, if we don't change, we're going to create ecocide. And it's, you know, we have to, some people are going to see the writing on the wall. They're going to start planning and thinking about community and sustainable living and living more simply. And other people probably won't, you know, and that's just kind of the way that it is. I, I feel that we are going through a collective uh, rites of passage and that humanity is being called to evolve right now. And the technology, like we've mentioned, it's there. It's so there. We just have to really work together to make it happen for all of us. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. The technology is, is right in front of us. It's like we we just can't see it at the time because we're so focused on our inner world. Um, and I, I'd have to agree with Mike. I think that this isn't something that we all have a choice in. I think this is a part of our evolution as a species, is our ability to cooperate and build collaborative systems that are sustainable because, we've seen what unsustainable life looks like, and it's it's basically killing us. Uh, we're not healthy. We're, the planet is not healthy, and it's, life is just not in its prosperity. Yeah, you know, uh, ironically, as we're talking about ascension, I mean, you feel as though that we're, we're uh, ascending as a species and getting better and better and better, but the irony of it is that we're going back to the grassroots or the uh, maybe the way the indigenous people have always lived and have taught us for for millennium. And the irony is we're going back to the basics to live the way we should be living anyway through this ascension process. Oh, absolutely. And I think that that's why we're being called back to nature right now. It's it's in our blood. And we're being called back to nature because nature knows how to do it. And as we look at that ecosystem and we see how it's cooperating and it's, it's sustaining itself, we're essentially activating parts of our our own lineage and waking up to a, a remembrance of who we are and why we're here. Great. Well, do you th do you think that a uh, like through things like the BP oil spill or or all the fracking that induces earthquakes or, or even like the Fukushima disaster. Do you think we've kind of opened up some areas we shouldn't have gone so far in and, and we're um, kind of tampering too many things on a bigger picture? Yeah, no question. Um, we, we've really opened up Pandora's box this time. And I think that, you know, I really do believe that nothing happens by accident, that there is, divine timing and everything, and honestly, I think it's serving as a wake-up call. I right. think that we are really given the opportunity to take a look at, at the destruction that we've created on this planet and go, oh my God, this has to stop, you know, and these these events, I get on YouTube every now and then, and I just like type in nuclear, uh, you know, Fukushima or whatever, and, and there's hundreds of, of young people, old people, that are becoming activated because they've seen what, what destruction has happened and they are, you know, ramping up and they're spreading the word. They're rippling out into into the greater community. I, I, I totally agree with you. And we talked about this earlier in the show the with the microcosm and the macro. And uh, so, um, yeah, you know, things that happen in divine timing and some things that look like they're catastrophic and they are in the moment, but they're also a catalyst for change sometimes. So if you look at the worst things that have ever happened, a lot of times if you look at the blessing in them, the blessing is that if that wouldn't have happened, we couldn't have had this change in a positive manner. So I agree with you, Al, and uh, and I like your explanation, Mike and Amy. Uh, I, I think everybody's on the same page, and we all know what, what – the, basically, like you said, the writing's on the wall. And uh, so – what can each individual person do is the next question. You have to get off the couch, quit looking at the TV, and do something, right? Yeah. Can yeah. we all do on that? Absolutely. Uh, high five on that. <laughs> Al, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think folks uh, get complacent in their lives, and, 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 uh, and they just get set in their ways. And it's convenient, like you were talking about earlier, 
and I think at some point they, they realize they have to find a sustainable way. Absolutely. Well, thank you for calling in. You had great questions. All right. Thank you. Talk to you later. Okay. Thanks, yeah, All right. you know, I think that uh, it's just like the forest has got to burn down for the new growth to emerge. Yeah, that's a, that's exactly a, that's an awesome analogy. It's basically exactly what we've been talking about. Um, we only have like about well, actually, um, you know, a minute left here. So um, my last question, if you can just make it brief, um, and I'll give you both a shot at this. Um, uh, what is the greatest overall benefit to living off the grid? Sustainability. Personally, uh, for me, it involves a full immersement in, in nature. It, living in nature for me is, is just like the pinnacle of of, of uh, what I want in life, you know? And that's, that's where it's at for me. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. Um, well, you know, thank you guys for being on the show. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, we'd love to have you back uh in the near future to get updates on what you're doing and where you're at and, and the new information that's out there or as far as the community living. And would you like to give your website or contact information one more time? Sure. That's The Mapmakers, and the website is www.themapmakers.org. And you, you can look up on YouTube. we got quite a few videos out there, and we have a documentary called Sustainability of Self. Uh, that'll be coming out later this summer. Awesome. Um, and I want to thank uh, the callers who called in and Terry. Yes. Um, and thank you very much, um, Mike and Amy, for just for all the the work you're doing and just uh, for the communication that you're getting out there for a lot of people. I think you're making a great difference. Oh, Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks to both of you for, for providing this opportunity for us to get out there and talk about what we're doing. It really feels amazing. Yep. All right, guys. Great work. Keep it up. And, uh, you know, stay in touch and get back to me, and we'll get you back on, like like I said, for updates. And uh, and if you got anything else going on, whether it be new documentaries, uh, you know, you have my number, so keep me posted. Awesome, Joe. We definitely will. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Dame. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. So next week we have, uh, let's see, Sunday, April 29th, James Gilliland and I discuss these current times, the changes that many struggle with, and the end of a cycle. Will we have a whole new world? Will it be an age of Aquarius? Tune in as we discuss the possibilities. Until next time, I'm Dr. Mara signing off. 